All right. I hope that everyone had a fantastic lunch and it has stopped raining. And thank you so much for coming back. Thank you. We had a fantastic morning session. We went to church. If you weren't here, you really missed out. Uh, we had a fantastic presentation, four presentations about the time. We had Declan McCarthy, who was incredible, about 777-9311, all the way from England. And we also had Christopher Daniel, all the way from the ATL, breaking down Prince's brand marketing and how it went awry. And then after that, we had Karen Terman, talking about Morris E. Day. And then last but definitely not least, we had C. Lee McGinnis taking us to church. Yes, we did. And then after that, I had my brother in book club, <laughs> Michael Dean. And it was such a blast, Michael, to do it live. It was so weird because we've been doing it since the beginning of the year for three months, virtually in little flat 2D rectangular squares. and. Sometimes he wouldn't get my cue, and you still didn't get my cue, and we were live. <laughs> so, but we're, we're still working it out, but we're working it like a job, because that's what we do. And I really, really enjoyed it, and I hope that you did too. So, I always, 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 always look forward to this panel right now. Yeah. Yes, clap for my brothers. Yes, just don't clap for Miles, but he says, <laughs> he says he's not going to be a contrarian this year. We're going to see. Oh, yeah, I see. So this is the core four. I'm still making a call for a better name. I remember we talked about yesterday, crystal ballers just ain't it. So we're sticking with the core four until we can find out a better name. So I'm taking all names, just letting you guys know. And um, so when we do more than one album, I actually have um, someone select um, the album. So when we did Dirty Mind Graffiti, um, well, DM40, GB30, and they'll actually chose Graffiti Bridge um, for our album. And then when we did One Plus One Plus One is Three, um, Zaire actually um, chose The Rainbow Children. And then when we did Triple Threat, I just knew Elliot was going to select Vanity Six, <laughs> but he flipped it on me. He was like, no, I want to talk about what time is it. And I was shocked. I was like, OK, yeah. And I'm still deciding if I'm going to let Miles Marshall Lewis choose next year. We're going to see. Um, <laughs> and next year, we are going to celebrate Definitely Come. And we're going to do that in, in August. That's going to be virtual. Uh, but the word is, I mean, uh, I'm still trying to figure out if we're going to do one in person for Purple Rain, The Glamorous Life, Ice Cream Castles, and Brenda Six. Yes. So, someone, uh, so Miles, Miles might have our fate in his hands, but I might pull a card. I might pull, I might revoke that that privilege and decide for us because I know what I would choose. It's not what I would choose. It should be, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Miles and I are always on the opposite ends of the spectrum. It would definitely be, would not be what I would choose. I would choose Brenda Six. That would be my choice because I love that album. And for those of you who don't know what Brenda Six is, it is also known as Apollonia Six. Yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right, so today we are going to talk about, again, one of the best albums recorded by Prince and Morris E. Day, What Time Is It? So we're going to get this party started. But before we do, um, let me turn on the screens. Blind. Hopefully you won't be too blind. Did you figure it out? Yes. Yes, you're the best. Everybody, please give a hand for Krista. Thank you so much. All right. For those of you out there in TV land, this is the Minty 
code M-E-N-T-I-D. I mean, ooh, I can't spell. M-E-N-T-I dot com. C-O-M. And the number for this is 1478-0288. 1478-0288. And if you don't want to touch your phone and you would rather go old school, just let Krista know and she will hand you a note card and you can fill it out. So... Without further ado, we are going to call these amazing men to the stage, one at a time. We're going to start off with someone who is indescribably uncategorizable, <laughs> the one and only, there can be not one other, is Zaire Ali. <laughs> yes. And for everybody who think they know about Prince, you don't know nothing compared to Anil Dash. <laughs> so as my friend Ricky Wyatt says, you know, there's always that one. <laughs> there's always the one, but we love him anyway. And that is the extraordinary music journalist and author <laughs> that is Miles Marshall Lewis, who is dressed to the nines. Love that. Yes. Yes. And for those of you who weren't here yesterday, Elliot gave an incredible presentation about the course he teaches at the University of Minnesota. I can't remember the name because it's so long. Shout it out for me. Prince Point in Public Space. Prince Porn and Public Space. <laughs> yes, and um, Elliot is really doing the Lord's work. He is teaching 80 students per semester about Prince and Prince Associate albums. I mean, that is incredible. Yeah. And what's even more incredible is that you start off at Vanity Six, which is really fantastic. So thank you for all the work that you do. And Elliot H. Powell. <laughs> He is also clean. You do see that purple? Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. All right, so let me switch the slides really quickly. All right, so I am going to ask the question I always ask, but I'm not going to ask it first. Um, so I know you guys are ready, and I know you guys are tired. She was like, when, when are we going to stop asking th these two questions? But we're going to ask it. I actually want to start off with Elliot. I was extremely shocked that you selected what time is it for our, our, our discussion why, what time is it over Vanity 6 or 1999 for that matter, but I just surely thought we were going to be talking about Vanity 6. Okay. Um, ooh, sorry. Uh, that's a great question. I think I initially did think about Vanity 6. That was one of the first thoughts that I had. Um, you know, for those who uh, don't know, when I usually talk about, w when we get to the question, the most favorite song on each Prince album or Prince, you know, related album, I always pick the most sexual song, right? That's usually how I go, right? Because uh, that's, that's, I want the funk, I want the raw, I want the, the kind of, you know, sort of unrestrained or sort of unrestricted sexual politics. Uh, and so Vanity Six comes fully into play there. But I think that there's also a way that it's really explicit in an album like What Time Is It? And so I thought, you know what, maybe we can actually do a lot with this album that, you know, has six songs, uh, six really distinct songs, but I think they also work really well together, 
right? And so I thought this would be a nice little change of pace for us, perhaps. Um, I think there's also a lot of things tied to politics in this album that I can talk about, maybe. But those are the things that I was like, there's a lot to work with here. Um, and, you know, obviously the time is just um, a, for me at least, it, it, I won't, well, yeah, I will say this. The time, at least for me, um, really becomes an interest of mine through TLC, right? Through the Poetic Justice soundtrack and their cover of, you know, sort of get up. And so, like, for me, that became my my kind of entry into them. Um, and so it also has a kind of personal attachment to me. It was later on that I got into Vanity Six. And so like for me, I'm thinking about where I was when 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 that particular soundtrack came out. So yeah, that's that's where that was coming from. Yeah, it's really and um, I probably shouldn't admit this, and so don't hate me, Elliot. <laughs> but when I heard TLC's version, I was like, why? Um, and <laughs> Like, I, I don't believe in covers. I mean, I, I don't, I really don't believe in covers. And so I really don't believe in Prince covers. Um, and to this day, I cringe whenever I go, oh my God. Um, and so it's interesting that you came to, to Prince, like, well, th to the time specifically through them. Yeah, I mean, so there's a, there's a, there's a thing that um, I, I sometimes talk to my students about this is like, one of the great things about Prince releasing an album almost every year is that he can meet a new audience every year. Mm -hmm. With the disbandment of the time, that kind of stops. And so for folks' entryway into other kinds of acts, it can actually be through covers. Right. So that ends up being, for me, my kind of entryway into the time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're absolutely correct. I mean, covers are actually really important. It really is, especially now more than ever, when I, when I, what I call post-Prince. Um, but in real time, yeah. Yeah. No. And I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that it's a, a great cover. But it, it. That was. That was my. That was my introduction. Yes. So of course. I can't, I can't knock that. Yeah. So I've. I have a request that someone can't go first. So we're gonna start off with Elliot. Oh. Okay. And um, okay. we're gonna start right. off with our usual inquiry, which is, um, what is your favorite song off the album, and what is your least favorite song off the album? And we only have six songs to choose from this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> and why? So, obviously. and why? Yeah. So, my favorite uh, is 777 seven, 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 um, I, I mean, obviously, it's funky as hell. Uh, you know, obviously, um, for me, I love, as, as really Declan, you talked about the kind of double entendre happening throughout the entire song, right? The play with, uh, you know, come being hard, right? That, again, the most sexual song. So for me, 777, you know, that becomes the, 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 the kind of hallmark song for me when I think about the time and, and I think about the funkiest, the rawest, the most sexual. That's the song that I'm really kind of, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go to. My least favorite, and this is, I didn't wanna go first, uh, is Gigolos. Oh, wow. I, <laughs> I told you I didn't wanna go first. This is like tomato, 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 tomato. <laughs> I, that is, yeah. Um, that's, that's a so it, <laughs> you got to talk about this, Elliot. I, th <laughs> Unpack that. So, okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing about, okay. Okay, here's the thing about gigolos. The way that I feel about Jiggle, oh, and this is more tomatoes. I just know I'm I'm turning into you in terms of today. Like this is, I'm 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 gonna be the miles for today. I'm gonna be the miles for today. Um, the way I feel about Jiggles is the way that I feel about you know three times two equals six, and is the way that I feel about free. I the, the, I told you I told you I was I knew I was like I'm gonna step into it, but this is I'm gonna speak in my truth. This is my truth here. I, it messes with the flow of the album for me. Okay. I like how, you know, the BPM works on the album and then we get to Gigolos and I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to, I, I'm not in that space right now, right? And I think it just messes with the whole energy for me of the album. I think, you know, it's a very nice, emotional, vulnerable song. Right, and I think that's very much important thinking about sort of Seely's presentation and sort of you know, sort of vulnerability of black men. I think that is really important, right? But for me, the energy just completely takes a nosedive with that song, 
Uh, and so I just can't get into the, and it's, you know, it's the fifth song on the album. So we're, we're basically at the end now, but like, I was just like, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm, I, I can't do this. Right. In the same, same way about three times two equals six. I was like, okay, cool. It's a, it's a closing song. I get it. But it does, you know, again, the energy is just removes that. And I feel the same way about free. It just takes a new kind of, it, it goes into a new direction that I, as a listener, am just not ready for and necessarily wanted to hear on that album like 1999 so that's that's my thing oh my god so i was actually going to um <laughs> i was going to ask this question um later but we we're already here the gigolos so we're going to ask this question right now so if you had to choose morris e day or prince gigolos which one elliot prince okay miles yeah, i'd say morris Okay, so let's talk talk more. Let's <laughs> let's hear why. I mean, you know, I was prepared to go with the best songs and the worst songs. Um, <laughs> that, you threw me a curve. Uh, I don't know That's why. That's what I do. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I have no good answer. I mean, um, I'm just maybe I'm just so used to it, or maybe okay. So Morris is this like uh, clown prince of R and B, let's say, and because it shows a vulnerable side of him. Uh, even though it's still kind of campy, uh, it's maybe unexpected, and so that's why I would go with his version because uh, it gives more facets, gives more dimension to his character. All right, uh, I'll, I'll kind of take that, and then Anil. It's got to be Prince, and I think it's part of every, especially in in that subsection of songs that Prince wrote for other people. For, to me, all I ever heard for decades was their imitation of what I knew was a Prince Scratch track in the background. Right? And I think, you know, St. Paul sort of epitomized this, right? Where you're like, I hear what you're trying to do, but I know it was probably originally on there, and I wish that you were doing that instead, right? And and so, and I love Morris, but like, the whole way through, when I first heard the song in the 80s, I was like, oh, I, I hear, and it was by, like, I came to it a little bit later, so it was by the time we kind of already knew that's that's really Prince behind the scenes. And then I couldn't hear it any other way but that of like, and actually to your point about the like covers, right? Like there were tracks that he wrote for others that felt like them doing a cover of a Prince song and not as good, right? And, and like that part of it was like different from how a lot of other artists wrote songs for, you know, people they worked with. Prince wasn't trying to like be like, here, let me give you something that's your, yours. He's like, see if you can do what I do. Right, which is fine. Like, obviously, the key, great results a lot of times. But that I think that song epitomizes that. Where like, I love like on on Gigolos, I love the I actually love when the beat comes in, but it does. I mean, it could not be slower. Right, it's slow, more slow and it stopped. Right, and so like I love the sound of the drum machine, that thing. So then everything is carried by voice, and the voice is like I, I feel like I can hear Prince's scratch vocals in the earpiece for Morris while he's singing. I never wanted that. All right, Zaire. I'm going to go with Morris, um, <laughs> just because that by that time, Prince had not crafted the gigolo character for himself. I could never see Prince calling himself a gigolo. Like, that's just not, um, that's not who he was at that moment. Um, and so even, even with all of that, like, musically, it's clearly Prince, right? Like, and and I can I can I can understand what you're saying because musically Prince's presence dominates in a way that it doesn't in the other tracks, right? Um, you I don't get the sense that this is a you know like we know this is all like Prince, but with the other songs you get the sense that this is a band. You you can you can like go with the idea that this is a band performing <laughs> the walk and seven 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 and you know like get it up you you can imagine a band you know like some, one of the ways that people listen they either they like listen literally like what is the song about or they imagine themselves performing the song or they imagine the performer performing the song and with the most of the other um, songs on the album you can imagine a band performing this this is a solo performance. Um, and because of that, that's why I think Prince, sh his shadow looms that much um, more on the on the song. But in terms of the content, I can't see Prince crafting this with himself in mind. So um, the, the, my brothers always like, oh, oh, why are we on a panel with you? So I enter Prince always through the music and never through the lyrics. 
So like at, in real time, like it, it didn't really matter if um, Prince would have sung that you know sung about being a gigolo because like it, the lyrical content it was only some key songs, Free being one of them. Free I really connected with Free lyrically in um, in real time, but for me, gigolos belong belongs to Morris E Day just from the vocal delivery. And I know you know some of us kind of like especially in the beginning when Morris was just starting out, make fun of Morris's delivery. This has come up at some symposia. I love Morris's vocal performance. And the thing about Morris' performance of Gigolos is that I believe him. Yeah. I believe him. I don't believe Prince when he <laughs> sings Gigolo. I don't. I don't believe him. And so, I don't know. I think if you really listen to that song, Morris is really, you know, for all of his sort of like player uh, personification, I feel like in that song, he's actually being authentic and not being a player. Like he's like coming from the heart and it comes through in that vocal performance for me. So I love it. And then also if you compare um, the originals version that Prince did versus the time version, you know, Morris adds some additional vocalizations, I don't know if that's the right word. Again, I'm from the South and we make words up. That's right. Um, that's right. <laughs> vocalizations towards the end of the song, they, that is powerful compared to Prince's version. So when I heard the original's version, I kept hearing Morris's vocals, particularly at the end, when it gets like um, that crescendo. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. So um, I found it very interesting. So. Did you finish? I, don't, I feel like you. Yeah, no, that was it. Yeah, that, that was, was it. it. We could. We could. You just we could, uh, took us I, on a whole detour yes, with your. I'm sorry. Eight. It was. I. You know. But that's. Yeah. Again. Yes. Step into my truth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's what I'm going to. Oh, yeah. All right. So, Mr. Miles Marshall Lewis, what is your least favorite hey, hey. and your most favorite? Um. Okay. So this has happened before on these panels where I'm like, because you know, being the the music critic of the panel, I kind of feel like. Uh, these answers are going to be obvious or like clearly the best song is blah, 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 or clearly the worst song is blah, blah, blah. And then it, 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 ne it almost never goes that way. <laughs> so, I mean, um, uh, for me, it's 7 7 11 is the best song. You know, it's my favorite song. Um, you know, it, in terms of like preaching to the converted or speaking to uh, an audience of people who know all the details already, I'm not informing anybody that... Jesse is going on the record to say that like the beat actually was not programmed by Prince. It was like a, a preset in the Lynn drum. Uh, and for years and years, people thought that, you know, that was like genius of Prince to have like done this thing that can barely be replicated by a human drummer, you know. Um, but aside from all that, the beat, it, it, it's just incredible. The guitar licks, like, you know, the whole thing really works for me. Uh, I would say as well, um, that I just have personal memories of it, you know. Uh, at the time that this album came to me, uh, hip hop was was really strong in my life, and it was like the golden age of hip hop, and it uh, was the beginning of this sort of uh, schism, schism between my father and I, um, you know, because he had introduced me to Hendrix and Sly, and uh, we were on the same page with a lot of things, and then he could he didn't understand hip hop, and so that was like, oh, that's interesting. And so, you know, overnight he was kind of um, uh, an old guy, <laughs> <You know? laughs> like uh, he didn't get it anymore, you know. And uh, and one day I was playing "What Time Is It," and um, you know, it's almost like a Cosby Show kind of memory because uh, it was, you know, in the afternoon and my mom was on the couch and and the the um, the the bass part comes up, you know, like the the where everything drops out and it's sort of just that part, and so. Being 14, I sort of reached for my air base, and I was like, you know. But at the exact same time, my father did the same thing because he knows the song or probably had heard it on the radio before me. And But then I couldn't put my air base down because he was <laughs> like, because he was doing, you know. So then we just ended up sort of walk, you know, circling the living room, playing the solo. So that was, you know, so I, I always remember that as being like this, this cute little thing, you know. Um, so aside from that, though, just, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a highlight of the album for me. Uh, it's the best song to me. Um, the worst, 
you know, so there are only six songs. I didn't say the worst. Right. <laughs> I said your my least, bad, my bad. Favorite. least favorite. My, my least favorite yeah. would be um, I Don't Want to Leave You, you know. And I, I think, um, to, right, like, you know, we're all going to make somebody aghast. But um, <laughs> to me, it's like, well, there's only six songs. So, uh, you know, I don't actually have a least favorite. But if I'm forced to choose, um, one day I'm gonna be somebody I like, you know, like that would maybe be the other one that I'm like, nah, that's filler, he could've left that off. Um, I don't feel that way about that, I like it. Um, and uh, Prince had this uh, uh, like uncanny ability to find the musicality in whatever it was. Like I think about, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, she, she Spoke To Me, is that it? On, on Girl 6 and how, you know, something that seems maybe basic initially once you hear like the longer version where it's stretched out it's like prince can do that to anything and so you know uh even something like um um one day i'm gonna be somebody i just imagine there being a 12 minute version somewhere that would like blow me away or whatever uh because he can do that with anything uh with nearly anything so i don't want to leave you um you know, I, I kind of wish that the album ended with like International Lover. You know, like I wish it ended with something sort of stronger and. Uh, oh, Miles. You know. <laughs> Wait till you hear my answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine what it is. Um, you know, but I, I do like the beat change at the end. Mm -hmm. That like that's dope. You know, I'm glad that we, I'm glad that we finally cracked that mystery uh, as well. That it's like from um, you know the um, remix of Makeup. Um, that that was cool to learn after decades of wondering why. Although we still don't know, actually know why. Right. Like, was it a reused reel? And then he just thought it was cool. Yeah, I think it was. It had to be a reused reel, and he just thought it sounded cool because it does sound cool. It's mm -hmm. for sure, quirky, for yeah. sure. And that, of course, could have been an o its own song. I mean, we always felt that that could have been its own song. Like, where's the rest of that? Yeah. And it turns out that there is a rest of that. Although, if it was recorded over, I guess we'll never <laughs> hear it. But perhaps we will. Um, so those are my answers. All right, Anil. Um, no surprise, I'm going to go with 777 for, you know, favorite song. But I think it's a little bit of a different lens. Part of it, like, you know, you talk about playing air bass. I was like, this makes me want to play, like, air drum machine. You know what I mean? Like, if that was a thing, because, like, right. <laughs> it's so synthetic and it's so artificial, unapologetically so. And like, yeah, okay, who was it programmed in the drum machine? Who did that? Whatever. Like, I didn't know any of that. I was just like, that's a computer and it's cool as shit. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of all I needed to know. And I think, you know, what people around that time were feeling about Kraftwerk or Gary Newman or something where like the sort of embracing the artificiality of it was bold. Like, yeah, it's like, that's a brave thing to do. Like the song goes, I mean, obviously like it's funky mm -hmm. as hell, but like, Sonically, it is so different. It's still so different. Right. Like you will not hear something like that, you know, from anybody right now, unless they're trying to copy what he was doing. And so I think um, that, like, that's brave, and and especially in the context of, like, sonically, there is there was a you know a blueprint that of the world that the time was stepping into then of like how the records sound, and and even the other songs. Like you listen to like the Walk, which is incredible. And it's like Morris on the drums, and you can kind of hear it, right. right? It's just there. And so to sort of be like in a band fronted by a guy who's a drummer with a great drummer being like, by the way, here's our drum machine. Um, yeah, I just think that that's a part. And I know that lots of people are going to talk about 777 and have been. So, like, mm -hmm. that's deep there. Um, th it's always terrifying to talk about least favorite. Uh, I, I mean, I actually – Gigolos was almost it for me, too, wow. um, for kind of the same reasons. I mean, I think it's sort of a little bit of – um, what would I talk about this sort of criticisms, but I, I think where I landed and I had a lot of time thinking about this because this is what we do every year is uh, <laughs> um, is one day I'm going to be somebody and not because I mean, it's fine for what it is. It's, it's like rockabilly trifle. He did 10 of those mm -hmm. around that time. Mm -hmm. um, but one, I think it sort of pierces the veil of this is a Prince song. Mm -hmm. Very obviously. Yep. Right. Like there's no like the conceit of the band is playing. Nobody's pretending, right. right? They're like, this is what we want to do right now, right? Like this is this is sort of like that thing, and also I think in the years since we've we've seen some of that dialogue where they talk about you know we want to get some of that uh, uh, Duran Duran money and we wanted to like oh, we were listening to like the Cure or whatever that was happening, and then like kind of hang hang a lampshade on that with like we don't like New Wave, mm -hmm. like I'm like either do it or don't do it, but this it's a little cynical honestly in a, in a way that's unusual where Prince sort of carries the character through 
and also you know the time would carry their characters through and 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 Bandy six would carry their characters through like they hold the you know the character the whole way through the album mm. and in that song the they let the curtain drop a little bit they sort of pierce the veil on it and so i think um i think separate from the merits of the song like obviously this isn't like this is the hardest thing he ever wrote you know what i mean like, it's just like he could do that that song's what like two and a half minutes long yeah, right. Right, and it probably took him about two minutes to write a two and a half minute song, right? And so, I, th I think that's part of the, the the challenge of it. I think the other thing is like, I always felt so I listened to the album on vinyl, right? And you know the side ends, and there was a I don't know if y'all remember, there was like a lot of vinyl left, right? It was like like the the run out was like big, and it was like, put something in there, you know what I mean? Like like fill that up. You got I know you got more. Put that in there. And so I think that was a little bit of like. You cheaped out and you put like it's five and a half song album because every other song is 10 minutes long. Right. right. And then here's this little one. So I think there was a little bit like this is like a very I mean, I was a kid, so it's a very childish kind of way to look at it. But it was like you could have put, you know, the walk part two and I would have been thrilled. So um, I think my least favorite is also one day I'm going to be somebody for this for the, I think the same reason it does not strike me as in keeping with what I was expecting from, you know, like you flipped a record over and you're like, wait, what? Mm. Um, so I'm not, I don't have a lot more to say. I mean, I like the entire album. It's really hard to, I mean, this is when Prince was really good at editing and kept it tight and there's a sort of, he had that at his best, this, this understanding that you give enough but not too much so people want to keep coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so interestingly enough, my favorite song is The Walk, which is one of the longer songs on there. Um, and uh, I, you know, I like it because of the groove, but also like, I am a lyrics person. Um, and I see The Walk, like if there's like a Prince verse, um, I see The Walk and dance music, sex, romance as crossover episodes. Um, b for me, dance music, sex, romance sounds most like a time song. Mm. Um, and, and so some of the themes also are explored are interesting, right? So there is the part where Morris is like hut to, well, no, not Morris, but first is like a, a caricatured, we'll just say caricatured white voice saying, you know, counting off the marching. And that is parallel to Prince, you know, all the white people clap on the floor and counting off, you know, it's just sort of like, we're going to teach you how to dance. We're going to teach you how to clap. Um, and there's, you know, there, there's a part in the, um, you know, in the walk where Morris uses the word Polaroids for squares, right? So like there's this, there's clear cultural discourse here happening about who's hip and who's not. Um, and then there's, of course, that we don't like policemen. Um, and in dance music, sex romance is like, you don't have to run, police got, got no gun. So there's a whole, like for me, there's, there's something very interesting happening there with these two songs meet each other in terms of the discourse around black communal, um, you know, uh, practices and how to protect your community and like culturally maintain um, a kind of standard. And if you want to be in that community, you can, but you have to learn our our ways right and we're, we're fine to teach you but you do have to get into the rhythm thank you zaire all right mr miles marshall lewis my favorite song off the album is i don't want to leave you i don't want to go can't you see i need you girl i need you so you oh my god you're you're Filler. not a replicant Wow. You are mouse. Wow. You are mouse. No, There's, it's not filler. I'm no, no. You you are mouse. And so every time we do this, mouse and I are always opposite. It is kind of uncanny. It's like the exact opposite. So that that's my favorite. And then um, it, it's but why why um, I I like the repetition. It becomes almost like a mantra, and I really love the. Um, keyboard solo that he does at the end, I, I think is really brilliant. And I like the chanting, like the call and response. Um, it's like a groove, and I could actually play that song every single day for 24 hours, and I would never get tired of it. And um, 
It's a very special song to me, and I mean, obviously, I love 777-9311. I was, and I had struggle. I was like, mm. which one I'm gonna say, 7793 or I don't wanna leave? But the thing is, to be honest, I play I Don't Wanna Leave You. When I pull out this album, I don't pull it out for 7793-11. I actually pull it out for I Don't Wanna Leave You, I Don't Wanna Go. And I think it's also my prayer to Prince in a strange way, mm. post-Prince. Mm. Um, I don't want to leave you, I don't want to go, but I, I've always loved the song. Okay. I, it was, it's, it's always been like a mantra for me, and it, the, the meaning of that mantra has changed over the years, um, but as I get older, it becomes even more nearer and dear to me. Um, and that keyboard solo, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, and the one thing that I love about this album, and I was hoping to talk a little bit about it, and it really shows up in 779311. I remember I saw Prince in a club in Atlanta, and I can't remember the year because I'm blanking. It was at Atlanta Live. He played one measure of the bass line to 779311, and I lost my mind. Right, right. <laughs> I lost my mind. Doom, 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 doom. And he like knew it. He was right, like, right. I ain't giving you no more. Right. And I was like, really? <laughs> I was like, really? Because one, Prince rarely pays, plays bass mm -hmm. in concert. So, you know, like for me, it's like Prince on the guitar is probably the most, you know, time. And then you go to the piano or keyboards the most time, then the drums, then the bass in terms of airtime on the stage. So when he picked up that bass and then he started playing seven, seven I was like, we're going to get into it. And then he was like, nope. nope. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I was really upset. So uh, the bass, this to me is Prince's bass album. And um, that's one of the reasons why I love it. And I always wanted him to record his own, what I call bass centric album. And he did eventually do that with Madhouse as well as the Black album. <clears throat> so. Whenever I listen to What Time Is It, I normally want to listen to actually the Black Album um, just because of the bass, um, some, some wicked bass playing on the Black Album. Um, and so my least favorite, I am aligned with my two brothers to the right, is One Day I'm Gonna Be Somebody because it didn't feel like a time song for me. It never felt like a time song. It felt very rock rockabilly and I know that Prince was in his rockabilly vein it is um, my second least time, not what I call a not time song. My first being Dance to the Beat. I still don't understand, like, you know, why is that a time song? Mm -hmm. And this, this came next because, like what Elliot said about, you know, gigolos, well, I don't know if you necessarily said it, but you, 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 it, I think you said it kind of changes the mood for, for right, you. Right. Like for me, one day I'm gonna be somebody actually changes the mood. It, I didn't, it didn't change for me with gigolos, but it definitely changes with one day I'm gonna be somebody. But uh, like Anil, I was like, there's space, you know, cause I feel like this song, um, maybe it went somewhere and we just don't know where it went. Like, is it in the vault? We wanna know. Um, so it would be interesting to see like if there was some play on that. All right. Oh, wait, okay, yeah. so you and I were at the Love Sexy show. Yes, uh, in Atlanta. In Atlanta, yep. uh, in 88. Did you see him at the Fox for, like, uh, Diamonds and Pearls type stuff? Yes. Or Symbol Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Because we're in the same line, too, for yeah. that, remember? Yeah. I s were we? Yeah. Oh, wow. You were at Tower. You were at Tower when he did yeah, the signing. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's right. And then we went to the Not show. Tower, but Turtles, I guess. Yeah, Turtles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Turtles. Um, and then we went to the Fox, you know. Yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought people were going to say Gigolos was the best song. I'm surprised that nobody did. Um, really? Yeah, just because um, I know it's beloved, and I know that, you know, in terms of the ballads that the Times yeah. did, uh, people consider it to be, you know. I mean, kind of not shit. to be like you, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I love the time, but I, I feel like even though their ballads are good, who goes to the time for ballads? Okay. Right. That's right. that's also, the, I mean, that's, that's that but was it my was a, But it was a good quiet it had a good run on quiet storm radio it did, right. um, sure. in a way that that early prince did not yeah right um you didn't get that sense until later and, and, and actually because purple rain didn't really have the quiet storm mm -hmm. music mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. even well into the that time period in like the 1984 when people are going back and revisiting his past catalog it's International Lover and Gigolos are the yeah. two songs that come back into rotation 
on Quiet Storm Radio and, and, and really kind of cements that the whole, you know, which I know that has been explored earlier today, um, the, the, like the ways that the time embodied blackness mm -hmm. um, in, in a very particular way that Prince did not intend to do with his work, mm -hmm. right? That it wasn't any less black, but right. it wasn't intended to embody it in the same way. And so when you kind of think, um, like I just remember older relatives, like they weren't messing with Prince the way they were messing with the time. And right. part of that is because of all the jams, but part right. of it was because of Gigolos, mm -hmm. because of its reign on um, mm -hmm. Quiet Storm Radio. Indeed. So we're going to pivot the conversation a little bit, and I want to talk about some of the skits and also the call and response on the album. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there are, you know, obviously we have skits on Vanity Six, you know, if a girl answers, don't hang up. Um, but like for me, the skit of all skits is the skit on the walk with Vanity. And um <clears throat> subsequently on non Prince albums, I've never liked any skits, but on Prince albums, even like on Exodus, I love <laughs> some of those skits because Prince is really funny. And I actually had the opportunity one time to ask Jesse like who was funnier, Prince or Morris? And he said, I can't call it because um, they were both pretty brilliant, but he did say that Morris um, was like wicked on timing of you know his humor and could really turn it around really quickly. But, and, and it's really, I think, apparent on the walk. And I would love to know if it was a collaboration between Prince in terms of that skit, in terms of how it was um, created. And then I uh, also love Vanity and the skit as well. Um, and it was a wonderful thing at that time in real time and hearing that, you know, hearing their voices. Because for a long time, we didn't hear Prince's own speaking voice. And so like being able to hear Vanity's speaking voice and then um, if Prince Vault is correct and what I'm hearing is correct, on Wild and Loose you have Susan and Kim Upshur and I love Susan's voice. Um, it, that should be really well known based on our Vanity Six conversations. So I'm curious like what were your relationship to the skits? Um, often sometimes when people say certain words like <laughs> like one of my favorite parts is stop trying to tell me things. Um, and so when someone says that, I pull up the skit in my head and I play it out <laughs> to myself. And, and, and parts of skits, you know, print skits do that for me. And I'll stop talking, but um, I will, I love Madhouse because of all of the dialogue that's embedded, particularly on Madhouse 8. And then you also have a lot of dialogue also embedded on the Black Album. And for me, it sort of started with um, these trilogy of albums, more specifically Vanity Six and What Time Is It? So what are your relationships to the skits? And we're going to start off with Elliot. Okay, wow. Um, I, I mean, I absolutely love the skits. Uh, much like you and The Walk is just incredible, right? And it's, I, I don't want to fast forward through the walk to get to the skit, but I kind of actually do, right? Where I'm like- I did, right? I it's did just, in real time. It, I would skip this, to the skit. Because it's just like, it's so funny. And obviously you can still hear the beat in the background, but it's, you know, it becomes for me, I didn't think about this in the time, um, but like almost a response to James Brown and Mother's Popcorn, right? Which is obviously a song about a woman with a fat ass, right? We, we kind of know this, right? But I'm going to go back to Declan's paper, right? Um, we, we don't hear the woman's response to James Brown in real time, right? right. There, there was a, oh God, I'm blanking out on her name, but there was an answer to Mother's Popcorn that James, one of you know, James Brown's acts ends up, yes, so I'm, I'm yeah, so I'm, I'm, yeah, so like it's, it's uh, yeah, so it's probably going to be, you know, so Lynn Collins, um, doing that right in the you know early sort of 1970s, but the walk gives us that in real time, right? And um, it, it becomes for me a, a perfect kind of response to that. Uh, it 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 becomes for me this this really funny back and forth, right? That I think is so necessary when we talk about the works and gender in music as well. Right, because far too often, um, you know, it's usually one side. It's usually, you know, going in one direction. But like Prince gives us that, Morris gives us that, The Time gives us that, Vanity gives us that, right? Um, and so for me, I absolutely love that. I um, love also Grace, 
right? So like, I love that kind of with the journalists in part because I think about Prince's own difficulties with journalists at the same time, right? So the, the way in which a song like Grace becomes another kind of, uh, another kind of commentary about critics uh, and about the engagement with critics, right? That I think is also really brilliant uh, and you know, sort of intertextual if we're gonna kind of use that word. Uh, and then I'm, I, Grace and both The Walk share the term grace, right? Which I'm very curious and I know that Jill Jones is in the audience, um, right? I, the, the, I, I don't know where grace came from Right, but I'm actually very curious. And I feel like, Jill Jones, you talked about this in an interview. Am I making this up? No. Okay. <laughs> you wanna share? I'll bring a mic. Yeah. Hold on one second. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I was like, oh God, Jill Jones is in the audience. So it's like the one time I might be able to ask this question. Thank you. Um, so I think Grace kind of evolved because there was a certain part of time where um, Morris really was funny. I mean, he was really funny. And if we were all out or doing anything, they always had like little side comments about people. And that really evolved from Morris. And then he would make comments about Grace. And so it was just one of those things that they were out and it became, it was sort of like that whole when he, in the other record, where it was like Emilio's Corgagadachi or whatever, you know, like the whatever, like Morris was really hilarious and it was sort of a take and then Prince and those guys together, they would laugh at people straight up <laughs> and they had inside jokes no matter what. That's how Grace came and it was one of their their things and they kept it and it was on on record. I mean, seriously, and a lot of times it would be at the expense of the person, like, <laughs> and sometimes since, you gotta remember, like, engineers, right. you know, right. they, the, they, excuse me, like, very white people would get it, <laughs> so yeah, that's what Grace yeah. ultimately was. Thank you so much for that, yeah. Jill Jones, thank you. Thank you, Jill. But that actually, and this is gonna be the last thing I'll say about this, is like, that being an inside joke for me also makes it even more powerful because it, be, it it invites the listeners into the Prince world, into the time, it invites us into this kind of intimate space that's shared by two black men that I think is actually really powerful. All right, Miles Marshall Lewis, what about the skits? Oh, so yeah, I love the skits. Um, what's the entry point for this? I guess, so the time was like uh, a group of guys and it, it, you know, like in like masculinity wise like it was sort of like a a, a boy space you know um it was campy but it was like i can envision this six group of guys being like me and my homeboys you know like um it was you know i kind of try to emulate that in a sense like growing up like okay so this is what a masculine space is like of a group of dudes. Uh, not that I never had that, but most of my relationships at that time, anyway, were sort of one on one. You know, like uh, with my favorite, my, like my best friend or whatever. It wasn't like a posse. You know, um, shout out to Mark Darkfeather in the house. Uh, <laughs> he belongs to the first posse I really had my freshman year of college, where it was like, okay, now there's five or six of us, and we're gonna, you know, arrive at the party at the same time, and we're gonna, you know, <laughs> like point at the you know girl with the what you know like it, get the phone numbers and like it was it was it was a posse up sort of moment right um so the time was that for me and the skits are just reminiscent of that kind of banter that you have with your boys you know um th there were music videos at the time recorded but like um let's say this is way pre hype williams era you know pre uh hyper sexualized hip-hop videos and the skit uh, with uh, Vanity trying to like pull her pants, you know, like you could just, you had to envision how fat her behind was. <laughs> and it, you know, there was a lot to that, at, you know, <laughs> back in the day, you know, it was like, well, goddamn, what is it, you know? Like <laughs> <laughs> well, how fat is it then, you know? Um, and so that was, you know, uh, that was cool, that was cool. Um, and Prince, yeah, Prince was always a very funny dude. Um, I'm currently writing a book about Dave Chappelle, it's sort of like a biography of Dave Chappelle, and so I've been immersed in comedy for like the past year, year and a half, uh, watching Richard Pryor and, and um, 
a lot of things that I imagine Prince saw, you know, as well, and Morris as well. Um, and, you know, <laughs> uh, he was just, he was a funny dude. Like, when I interviewed Prince, um, when I went out to Paisley and talked to him, and uh, I asked him at some point about uh, the beautiful ones and the inspiration behind it, and, you know, I just happened to mention that I had read somewhere that Susanna inspired it, and he told me that Suzanne had not inspired it, that, in fact, it was whatever he told me it was, right? But then later on, when we were... <laughs> I like how you just like, you just like, I'm a turd now. But, <laughs> but <laughs> that is not the point of the story. <laughs> the point of the story is that later on, uh, we went to his sports car. He was going to play me some music, and we were walking down the corridor of Paisley. And he says, to, like, he just sort of says to me or to himself in that, you know, sort of Jamie Starr voice, like, um, you know, this, or maybe Vanity's voice for that matter, or uh, Susanna's voice, I don't know. Like, you know, this song's about me, and the other one's about Bob Seger. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, let's go on that tangent, because yeah, yeah, uh, sure. part of what I heard from folks, who paid, so uh, I had written a piece about, like, how, you know, Purple Wing came about, and in that piece, and I think folks had quoted this before, uh, Matt Fink had said, oh, we were following Bob Seger around. I think that sort of right. seemed to I mean, like, cause to but me, Alan quoted. Light had said that That's in a right. book. That's right. And, and he got so quoted in. he got it from right. but Dr. It had Fink. That, and, and I mean, I think Alan had written that years before. Right. The piece I wrote was right before you went there. Oh, right. And I know it had gotten shared. And so, like, oh, it goes okay. some part. So, I think it had right. come back up again. Not because of <laughs> yeah, me, but yeah, just because, yeah. like, the conversation has come back up. Sure, sure. And I think that part of, like, to the point about, like, journalists, right? Like, like. To have Grace be, uh, here's a tangent about let me just get my shots in yeah. mm -hmm. at the same, you know, in the same moment that we're doing all the critics and all this kind of things. Yeah. Like, this is this recurring thing of like processing relationships to the outside world, mm -hmm. people's relationships to him about what are you claiming you know about me? Sure. Mm -hmm. People trying to give credit for like, it was not a white artist that made Purple Rain happen, by the way. Right. right? Like, all these things sort of fitting together. And it's just such an interesting thing because like, that motif stays all the way because you're talking to him 20 years later, right? 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 Yeah, 30 years later. Shit. Yeah. And so like that's <laughs> Matt. And, and and like that's wild is that like that thread just keeps coming back. Sorry. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, we had discussed horns in his music, uh, and I had asked him had it come from Bruce Springsteen, and he was you know, and which was something else that Alan had mentioned in one of his books, and he was kind of like you know, no, dude, like why is it always the white people actually? Right. Right. <laughs> So Anil, first of all, don't say sorry. And I want us to have a conversation. So feel free to dive in whenever you want. But I did, you reminded me of something. So I'm actually really thrilled that we're doing this in person um, in a very long time, like from since 2019 is the last time we did this in person. Because every time we've done this virtually, we have an amazing conversation backstage. We are like cracking it up. And I feel like that when we go out into the public, we sort of like, become more presentable. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and so we didn't have the opportunity to kind of like pre-game, I think, but maybe three of you might have done a little pre-gaming, but it wasn't all of us. So I think it's great when you bring up conversations. So just bring it on, everybody. If you feel, if you have the urge, just bring it on in. Um, so Anil, what about you and the skits? So, I mean, I love the skits, but I always felt like they were kind of like, the song was playing in the background while they shifted from the song proper into now we're gonna have some fun, and which you know which is great. But but I, and I think part of it is my you know engagement with that was with stuff like Grace too, where it's like very explicitly like we're over here having fun. And I rediscovered a lot of this stuff several years later, which was at the same time as I was finding like you know De La and Three Feet High and Rising and the sort of rise of the hip hop skit, which and they were great and it was really clearly a bunch of friends. We've got the ability to make records at home, so we're going to goof off a little bit. Like skits are also a um, manifestation of uh, lack, like less uh, reverence about the studio, right? If you were paying for studio time versus you're in like the basement of Prince's house, you're not doing skits. You know what I mean? You're like that's a whole. This is like you can't afford to, right? And so I think some of that was like a glimpse into like the the creative environment they had made was that you could be that casual to share an inside joke with a bunch of friends and sort of put it out there. I think it's also the confidence of knowing that people will find this funny, right? Because you weren't, like, that wasn't going to happen on a Cool in the Gang record, right? Like, you had to go, and, like, they're geniuses, but that wasn't going to happen where you're like, we know people are going to go with this on this. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, even the, the artifact, like, the, the cultural artifact of the moment, like, it's, I think people would not believe you, one, like, 
part of the dialogue of you know designer jeans and 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 all this kind of stuff is the Jordash is on the rise yeah. and like that was such a cultural Sergio thing. Valente. That's right, and and that people were like, why would you care about the brand on some jeans? Why would you care about the alligator on a shirt? Like that was a novel idea mm. in culture, and that like that seems wildly that seems as anachronistic as the idea that like people were there were people trying to have small butts in 1981. That's wild, <laughs> right? You know, like, like, and you like, you wouldn't believe it if it wasn't captured on record right. that there was a conversation about like, you know, oh, okay, this is another option, right? And so I think that that was really um, what was so remarkable about it was the like, the, the the realness, and and also the the left turn from like we made this great song and it's going to be good in the clubs to like, and by the way, now we're going over here and we're going to have some fun, which. Clearly, you didn't expect the DJ was going to let that part play. So you were sort of doing something else. It was like headphone funk, mm -hmm. which is different than dance floor funk, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that was a really, really interesting thing. And sort of last thing on that, the contrast to 10 years later, another set of segues about engaging with a reporter. Right. And it's kind of boring and incoherent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like I think that sort of speaks to like that's the difference between having your, you know, like your voice with you doing it. Huh. And it's like the jokes you actually make when you all go out and still have a life out there versus like a really conceptualized version of it where you're like, you know, it was nothing to cut it out of the album because it didn't make any sense anyway. Right. I think that's an interesting contrast. Yeah. Talk about Vanessa Bartholomew. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Vanessa, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Vanessa Bartholomew. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the difference between Grace and Vanessa Bartholomew. Right. Right. It's pretty yeah. profound. Uh, I, I mean, I think everyone said a lot that I would agree with. Um, I would just add that I think I'm sure there were lots of things that Prince wanted to do before he left. Um, but I definitely know that he wanted to do a musical. Um, he there's so much theatricality in his that's like simmering just below the surface, wanting to come out. And the skits are part of that, right? They're, they're kind of a, um, a different kind of audio world making that almost takes me back to like the radio show um, and, and, and relying on um, a different kind of set of audio cues, right? So like tone and, um, you know, uh, pace of speaking timing. And, and timing, like, and it's all audio, right? Like it's no, you're not seeing it, but you are actually imagining it while it's happening. So it relies on a different kind of skill set to paint a scene with, you know, it's, it's show, don't tell, right? There's no narrator here, right? <laughs> um, so to me, that's what I always, um, you know, when the, uh, for that, and, and you mentioned for Exodus, this, the skits for the Symbol album didn't work um, for me because there was a contrivance. Um, and because the skits were all separated from the songs, mm -hmm. Uh, with a CD, so it was easy to skip. Whereas these, do you have to get through most of them. You have to get through the song, right? Um, and and I think somebody somewhere is going to do a paper one day on how Prince ended songs. Like there is, he had a very specific way of how to complete a song. Like he usually didn't do a fade out, right? right, right, right. Um, and that has something to do with his sense of like symmetry and how to like you begin, you go on this journey, and you end. And so there is this theatricality that the skits lend themselves to. And it shows that Prince was, I mean, you have to be a musician, you have to be a good listener. Um, but it shows that Prince was a really good listener of people um, that he could then replicate certain kinds of vocal cues uh, in speaking to convey like a whole scene. So when you were talking about, you know, it being like a radio show and having to imagine, you know, the scene that's being described, I did that with um, The Walk and that conversation and dialogue. And I don't know, whenever I think of The Walk, I think of this scene in Under the Cherry Moon um, when he climbs up to, to what he thinks is Mary Sharon's room. <laughs> But Pizza it's man. actually in yes. the dark, <laughs> and he's, he says, baby, wait, ain't into all that. <laughs> and I realized on the spot, it was like, the reason why I really love that is because you really can't see, mm -hmm. but you can hear, okay. and you kind of imagine. And so thank you for that, because I was like, why do I always connect to that? So I am going to ask another question, but we do have some questions from the audience as well as some suggestions for another core four name. Let me um, give you a couple. Okay. Um, one is the yeah. For You crew. 
The For You crew. Okay. The For You, but with F O U R. Yeah. That's kind of okay. nice. I like that. All who right, th- who said right. that? Are you here or are you online? Yeah. Was that you, Carol? <laughs> I think that, I love that. <laughs> the other We're one a was... a branding workshop now. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. The other one was Four Funketeers. But I love the Four You crew. I that like is the Four brilliant. You crew. The Four You crew, good. Yeah, good. thank you. Yeah. Please let me know who, who did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then someone agrees with me about No Prince covers. Thank you for that. Um, so we have a couple questions from Celie. I'm going to ask this one. Um, what do y'all think about the ending phone call of Joint to Joint being the closest that Prince comes mm. to his uh, hit to his on Ooh. Gigolos Get Lonely? Wow. Mm. Right. <laughs> Why y'all think there goes Celie again with the back. deep question. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think the first thing that threw me on that is I. I never thought of the end of joint to joint as a phone call like i know the sound is there but like it it, it uh-huh. it's a it's right. more of a dialogue yeah. right? Right. right right um which is not really the point but it's still interesting um i i think actually the things that felt most like they're in dialogue with the the, the skits on this album and the conversations was the exodus segues mm-hmm. i mean i think those felt like this right. is a bunch of friends hanging out goofing off kind of thing so i think that was more, and, and because and actually a contrast to Anything on it on Emancipation, which like I love that record, but feels very much like kind of Prince alone, right. alone, alone in right. a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. And I was just thinking just the, the fact of people not believing that Prince could do a, you know, but Prince could do a Gigolos get lonely. That mm-hmm. those who said they couldn't believe it that when you listen to that phone call, what's interesting about that phone call is that he actually because you you don't, you don't hear the the, the female. And but what you can get is he causes, hey, it's me. And what he says after that, what you assume is she says something like either you're not with that other bitch or you th- <laughs> because what he says is that no, 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 that's all over now. Mm-hmm. And then he goes, quiet as is kept, and she's like cuts him off. Right. Like I'm gonna hear that shit. So it's it's clearly that, you know, based on that phone call, it's a it's a whoever this female is, he's had some kind of relationship with her. And now he's decided, okay, I want to have a real relationship. Mm-hmm. But based on what he's saying, she's saying, it's too late. Well, I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then at the end, and it gets, what I find is that the way he responds is like he's saying, and I don't want you to believe this speaker was sincere because, which then makes it maybe not can be like Gigolos Get Lonely. Because I always read the other as he gets pissed off because she don't want to hear it. And he goes, no, no, all right, later. I could like, you're not buying my bullshit, so I just call you back. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's kind of like, to me, the closest he gets to gigolos get lonely too. But even then, maybe not because he's not sincere and can't take the fact that yeah. she's fed up with his BS. Yeah, you're talking about emotional vulnerability, right? right and I feel right. like 96 and 2016 are the only two moments where he really performs that in a way we can see. Right. right? And, and 96 was a little like, kind of tentative step for all the obvious reasons in his right. life. And then he sort of for all the obvious reasons, pulls back, yeah. right? In 2016, I mean, that was the most exciting thing about it to me. Right. I was like, you, you said the thing, like when he talks about, like, I miss Denise, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. like, that's the realest shit he said in, on right. stage right. in his right. life, no performance. Right. And I think Gigolos is in that other space where it's like, I've, I've torn down the veil. I've sort of thrown away the, the image. I'm doing the thing that's real. The thing that got me was the international lover outtake because <laughs> when he laughs about... Uh, you know, the sort of metaphors at the end of the song, he sort of giggles and reveals that he's mm-hmm. in the Morris character. Mm-hmm. He never broke about performing International Lover on stage. Right. Right. right? right. And so I think, like, because it was campy. Right. right. Mm-hmm. right? But he never conceded that. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, like, it took us hearing it afterwards where he was like, yeah, I know this is a little over the top, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, I really went there. And if Morris had done it, Morris, we would just know, of course, right. he's right. being right. campy, right? right? right. Yeah. And so I think that's the thing that's powerful about Gigolos. And, like, I, I think it's. L- lyrically and performance wise that's what's great about it, is it's very vulnerable in a real yeah. way yeah. but I think that's also part of what takes me out of the album is I'm like that's not the lane we're in for any of the right. other stuff exactly yeah. Yeah. so we actually have another question from C. Lee um, because sampling kept me from embracing hip hop does it make me a hypocrite for not having an issue with the sampled drum programming for 777-9311 
I mean, there's a there's a definitional thing here, right? What's a sample? What's the context? What do people see as an instrument? They call it a drum machine, not a sampler, although the drum machine he was using could be called a sampler, right? right. And so I think there's there's a little bit of like our navigating originality, creation. I mean, even Prince talking about, you know, don't cover my music without permission. By the way, here's this other person's song I'm doing at the Super Bowl, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, uh, okay, so yeah. there's some fuzzy yeah. spots here, right? And I think that like that navigation of like, who had permission to use what music for what, right. and then, that, right, and also tied really deeply into credits, right. which like the entirety of the time is an exercise in like, how accurate do we want stories to be mm-hmm. about who did what, mm-hmm. you know? I Y'all feel know like Elliot, me. you look like you're lost in thought. No, no, because I, because I am. Like it was one of those things where I was like, there's so, m- I mean. One, I don't want to call Sealy a hypocrite, right? <laughs> so that's, don't want to, I don't want to kind of, because I'm, I'm not in a place to make that kind of value judgment. But part of the, I'm, you know, and obviously I'm not the first one to say this, but like for me, sampling is a uh, form of quotation, a form of illusion, right? So for me, it can be a very musical, but also literary right. kind of device, right? Um, and so um, this is less about the Lynn drum machine, but I think there's a way that, even, and, and, and I, you know, I talked about this earlier, that part of how I understand also what time is it to be a political album is actually the, that, that exact phrase about, you know, so what time is it? Because for me, it recalls what stacks and Jesse Jackson in, night to, in, in nation time, right? So there's a repetition that he asked for those who don't know what stacks. It was um, a sort of music festival uh, that, you know, what, uh, that, that, uh, sorry, that stacks put on. Uh, in, 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 in really August of 1972. Richard Pryor was the host. Yes, Richard Pryor was the host, but the opening is Jesse Jackson, uh, where he reads a poem of Baraka's Nation Time, but then he asks the audience, you know, so what time is it? And they say Nation and Time. And it's the what same year as what's it? going on. Exactly, right? And that, that kind of repetition and the call and response about what time is it in August of 1972, and then we have the time in, in August of 1982, 10 years later asking what time is it? So there's a way that, that it becomes a kind of reference and a callback where in 1972, it's about like, we're tired of the incremental patient, patients around black politics, right, of the 1960s, of the 1960s, we need something different. We need nation time in the 1970s. That for me, what time is it in 1982 was asking a similar question about what kind of time is this for us as black men going into the 1980s and the politics that we want to embody. So less about sampling, but I think even the phrase what time is it is a kind of reference, is a kind of callback, is a kind of illusion, is a kind of quotation that we can see how something like the Lynn drum machine is also riffing off on, right? So taking something, but doing something wildly different, right? Moving it in time, no pun intended, to something else. Uh, and so that's, that, that's why I was kind of deep in thought with that. I think it's also the reflexive musicality of like, their music is just a language they're all speaking to each other in the creation right. moment. So like, I mean, you got a guitar solo that plays jingle bells on this album, right? right? Like yeah, there's right. just everything. Yeah. Like yeah. that's how you communicate to each other. Yeah. So there's this really great comment in the, um, the I'm going to call it chat, um, and it says, the lyrics to I Don't Want to Leave You captures the emotive theme of Zora Neale Hurston's gilded six bits notion of a man forgiving a woman for infidelity, which helped me recon- recognize my toxicity. So that's, that's, that was at C. Lee. <laughs> I was like, that is deep. Of course it's C. Lee. It really is. All right. Wow. Um, I have a, pr- this is going to open a can of worms, but we're going to open it. Uh-oh. This is a question. All right. And I do want to talk a little bit about Jamie Starr before we leave, because uh, the Starr production really hasn't been talked about this weekend, right. which is kind of surprising, but that's okay. We're going to do it right now. <laughs> um, and the question is, D'Angelo and Pano, what do you think about Prince's covers of other songs, like my favorite, not... <laughs> Betcha by golly wow. Mm-mm. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So, like I said, I didn't like people covering Prince. I didn't like Prince covering other people on record, right. like on the right. studio records. He can cover all day long in a live show right. because, like, the um, Just My Imagination on the Love Sexy After Show, mm-hmm. like, some of those guitar solos were incredible. But, um, I might get hate mail, but when Emancipation came out mm-hmm. and the lead single was a cover, mm-hmm. right. Right. 
I was disappointed. Right. Because, like, Prince don't do no covers on the record. <laughs> <laughs> on record. Right. Right. And then not only was there one cover, what's this, like, four right. covers yeah, yeah, on yeah, yeah. Emancipation. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what? Like the universe is like (laughs) flipping. And so I hated it on record. But you know, again, like he's done some brilliant covers live, but in the studio, I say to Prince, leave it alone. It's just the way I would tell anybody else to leave Prince alone in the studio. You can play live all you want, but don't be trying to record Prince. All right. No, I mean a man with four thousand. <laughs> he he's got like four thousand songs. He, in yeah. the Like that we haven't heard. Exactly. You don't have to bother with anybody else's material, really. Yeah. Um, I. But then um, I think that that to me that then begs the question: Why, right? Like, what is the intention here? Um, that because I don't think Prince did like. He was like, oh shit, I ran out of songs. Let me go do this <laughs> cover. Um, that was not the a, problem. There's no. like, you know what I mean? Wells like, run dry. And, right. And, and I think I know that. So part of it was he, he sometimes, some of the covers, especially those two, he wanted to pay people back. Yeah. He yeah. wanted to get royalties. Like this was his way of getting royalties to people. Right. Um, and so I think that there's some, there's like a political reason for it. I do think that he, the rollout for emancipation was very, you know, initially like family. It was like the Oprah yeah. audience, like, you know, older. I mean, my parents loved it, right? Like, not because they loved the cover, but because they loved a gesture to their music, right? Like, there was a sort of like, oh, okay. So I, I think. I mean, I also didn't like, I was like, what, what is this shit? But, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, thinking about like, okay, what is the intentionality behind this from mm-hmm. someone that we know down to the zippers on his shoes mm-hmm. was very clear about like how and what he was doing. And so I was like, yeah. you know, what could this be? And, you know, like he felt indebted to, um, you know, the artists that he covered that he wanted to like pay them for something. Um, oftentimes, I mean, I remember reading somewhere like he didn't even pay the standard royalty rates. Like it was just like a way of getting money to people. Um, but you know, I do think that there was also this attempt to like let an older, the generation that he was trying to sell to, like, be like, oh, okay, yeah. this is. No, I wanted to piggyback on the intentionality aspect because one of the most startling things I saw in concert was was Prince uh, starting to, what well, the band anyway, starting to perform like songs by the Jacksons, you know, right, right. <laughs> after Michael Jackson had passed away. It, you know, I was at a Prince concert hearing, what was it, like, uh, shake your body down to the to the ground. I was like, yo, they going there? Is he about to come out and start singing Michael Jackson? And then like that didn't happen, but it was like just the instrumental happening and I guess maybe Shelby came, you know, sang a few lines or whatever. But, you know, that was to put Michael in the space and, and to let you know that Michael was on Prince's mind after he had passed and stuff. And and as well, the cover of uh, When Will We Be Paid? Even, yes. You know, by the yeah. singers, you know? Yes. Which, um, had a, a very like focused intention. This is what I it, I think know? his recorded covers were really sincere. I think they were really intentional and really sincere. And I think you look at part of it is at the time when Emancipation's come up, he had just had one of his biggest hits with you know uh, Most Beautiful Girl, which is a, in almost every way it can be a Philly soul song. Right. And so I think for him to sort of say, I wouldn't have this if not for you all. Let me take care of you because, and also, how many of those, you know, putting aside uh, the, the Joan Osborne cover, like how many of these, you know, these songwriters are in need? And actually, and to that point, like I actually, that cover of One of Us, like I didn't, I didn't have much use for the, the original song, but his cover of it, I like, I love that song. I think it's a good song. It's not, and I was he like, changed it, right? And, and, and so, like, that better. was the other thing when, when, yeah. like, I'm always fascinated when Prince did cover, like, I mean, when he covered Creep. Like he changed the lyrics around wildly like, so in yeah. a like yeah. mean spirited way. Like he like he was no longer the creep. He was like you're a creep. <laughs> but with one of us, I remember when he performed it in the Jam of the Year, um, and because of the rollout of that album, um, you know, and because he had been you know sort of underground in terms of mainstream. 
um, there was a lot more black folk in the audience who had not been exposed to one of us. And when he would play it, he would say, like, I want y'all to listen to this song. Yeah, he meant it. Right? He meant it. And he changed slob to slave, right? right. Like, there was, like, a very clear um, political agenda right. with that And also, song. he was never going to call himself a slob or a yeah, creep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? That's not going to happen, right? And, and I think the thing is, like, it's really sincere in the point of, like, I'm never a creep and I'm never a slob. And also... This means what it means. Yeah. These artists mean what they mean, and and I think that's that's why I really, um, I went there with it. Like I liked being challenged on it because I had had the same attachment to like he doesn't do covers, right? Because that's how we all we like we loved that he was better than the other artists. I mean that was really it. It was like well it was a good feeling. It was like this guy you can't mess with him. He's he's the best at all these different things, and I think it was a really nice thing to sort of be challenged on that. He's like we can do this. And also, you know, I think he said like, Oh, we'll get attention. Cause I'd never done covers before or whatever. But I, I, I think it was very sincere. And, and I think that's a, um, I loved that complexity, right. That he had around his stated rules around credit citation, sampling covers were crystal clear and they were grounded in theory. They were grounded in how black artists get exploited. They're grounded in ownership. They're grounded in equity. And every single one of those rules he broke. At different points, whether it was on his records or on stage or whatever, because he's like, I'm following the muse, I'm following my heart. And that was also really sincere. Like, I think that's a really I loved that he was on both sides of that. I mean, out to come back to the question about the the drum programming, the pre-programmed um, hi hat, especially and um, for seven seven. I, I and I don't know this. Uh, I wonder if Declan, because I know you gave a presentation on this earlier or if anyone else has that been used. Do we know of other examples where that you know, sample was used by another musician, be, be, because the way Prince used it exactly. um, is very unique, right? And I think that that's uh, not to like sneak preview my presentation, <laughs> but like cross promote, Zaire. Yo, I'm cross Do promote. It. Well, I know. Also, I, I imagine Dan oh, Charnis is going to get into this tomorrow, oh, yes, right? He is. So oh, yes, I imagine he he's going to get into this. Yes. Um, but there is this. Like Prince and technology, I mean, like, and he had an interesting thing. Like, you know, we all know that real music by real musicians did not mean not like non mechanical sounds, right? Like, it didn't, that wasn't what he was talking about. And so there is this like Prince and Afrofuturism uh, preview for now, I'll come back to the next session. Spoilers. Uh, <laughs> um, there, there's always the question of like, what is the element that you are introducing? Um, to challenge the constraints of technology, right? Um, and or to bend the technology. And we know the like the the stories of like um, Susan Rogers talking about how they like didn't follow the rules in using the mixing console and the equipment because it was just like I just needed to do this. Um, and there's a way to read that as. Um, you know, sort of impulsive, but there's another way to read that as part of the Afrofuturistic tradition of how to engage technology um, to serve you and not to be to not be in service to the technology. And I think whenever he talked about real music by real musicians, and he came around on sampling by this time, it was always like, make sure you understand who the creator of this moment is, even if you're using elements that have been crafted elsewhere. So I you know, I, I think that's how I mean, you know, there is sampling, there's interpolation, and there's like straight up covers, right? right? And I didn't see um that in that instance. Yeah. All right. So we're almost at time and I wanna do something well, I don't want to do something. I hope that you will do something special for me. <laughs> but there's a great question. That we're going to ask before I do that, I'll set it up. So does someone wants to answer this really awesome question? Thank you for whoever submitted it. What time is it is an album that doesn't have a song by that same name? Thoughts on why? Great question. OK, I'll, 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 I'll take a stab at it very quickly, because uh, I know we're running out of time. Uh, again. No, no pun intended. Yeah. Anyway, um, but I, but I think it, part of what I think is it doesn't actually need to be a title on a song, in part because time is what organizes all the other sets of songs, right? So if we think about Wild and Loose, that's about age. If we think about Seven Seven Seven, right? Um, that's about 
uh, a kind of sort of delayed kind of gratification, right? So that's another temporal uh, kind of sequence. If we think about, you know, one day, that's about a move toward the future, right? So I can go on and on down the list that every song is about time. So there's no need for what time is it, right? So I think that's that. God, I'm going with yeah. that answer. I'm going with that answer. <laughs> Let me see if I can. <laughs> huh. That's gonna be your next article, right? Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I'm gonna work on right now. Because it just came to me. <laughs> All right. So I want you to do something for me. If you know this song, please sing it. You would make my day. And um, let's see. Go get into it slow first. us to sing it when it, you, you know the, you know it when it starts. Here we go. I need you, I don't wanna go. Come on, I don't hear you. See, I need you, girl, I need you so. Come on. I don't wanna leave you, I don't wanna go. Can't you see I need you, girl, I need you so. I don't wanna leave you, I don't wanna go. Are you going to ask the same? <laughs> <laughs> My least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for indulging me.